Here's a little statistic that I predict will get the fingers of avid YouTube commenters twitching right from the get-go. According to a report called the Kelly Blue Book, in 2023, the United States added a record 1.2 million new electric cars to American roads. But instead of putting extra strain on the country's electrical grids, total US electricity consumption actually went down last year, not up. Why? Well, because devices and appliances continue to get more and more efficient as technology improves. In fact, according to the US Energy Information Administration, or IEA, overall US electricity consumption has barely changed at all for the last 20 years largely due to better building codes, the nationwide rollout of low energy alternatives like LED light bulbs, and the widespread adoption of things like heat pumps. Just as well really, because the three main US grid networks are old and have been creaking at the seams for a long time. But America, just like the rest of the world, will need additional electrical capacity at some point, and adding that capacity to those aging networks is a full on modern day nightmare of land appropriation, rights of way negotiations, and permitting bureaucracy that can take years and years and cost millions of dollars to get through. So if there was some way to eliminate those hurdles and save a good chunk of that cost, then surely we'd be onto a winner, right? Well, there is a way, and it's been staring us in the face all along. It's called reconductoring. Hello and welcome to Just Have a Think. Just like most modern developed nations, the United States is covered with a vast network of pylons supporting big thick cables taking electrons from where they're generated to where they're needed. The pylons often run across privately owned land and in most areas the idea of adding more of them is greeted with very strong local opposition and requires extensive environmental assessments all of which can mean that the permitting and construction process can take 10 years or more to complete. Time we don't really have if we want to get all that additional renewable energy capacity factored into the system before the end of the decade. But here's the thing, there's nothing really wrong with the existing pylons. It's the wires that are strung between them that are the problem. They're typically quite antiquated and made of a relatively inefficient mix of materials they were perfectly adequate back in the days when wasting electricity really didn't matter because coal was dirt cheap, the atmosphere was an invisible open sewer for greenhouse gas emissions, and most homes were only running a tiny television, a twin tub washing machine, and a single light bulb in each room. So while clever engineers at the consumer end have been using modern technological advances to vastly improve the efficiency of the myriad everyday devices that you and I now take for granted, other similarly clever boffins at the distribution end have been developing materials that will allow them to send far more electrons through their cables. A recent online webinar hosted by CTC Global explained in some detail how these new conductors differ from existing technology and what sort of impact they can have on project costs and timelines. The webinar itself is an hour and a half long, but the salient points are worth summarizing here. And by the way, I've left a link in the description section to the full presentation if you want to get the information straight from the horse's mouth. Anyway, here's the potted version. The wires used for the last 100 years or so consist of an aluminium conductor with steel wire armour protection, more correctly known as Aluminium Conductor Steel Reinforced or ACSR. In the 70s that technology was improved a little bit with something called Aluminium Conductor Composite Reinforced or ACCR cable which provided more capacity and less sag on the cables themselves. Sagging is not a small problem, by the way, as those of us of a certain age know only too well. On an electrical grid, it's more than just an unsightly irritation, though. It can be a very dangerous hazard. In extreme cases, lines can come close enough to adjacent tree canopies that they can cause a significant fire hazard. They can also interfere with each other. In 2003, there was a major blackout on the east coast of America predominantly as a result of excessive conductor sag that tripped out the entire northeast grid. That event arguably accelerated the development of composite materials to further increase strength and reduce the weight of those long cable runs between pylons. And that led initially to aluminium conductor fiberglass reinforced or ACFR cables being introduced and then to aluminium encased composite core or AECC cables using carbon fibre in the conductor. The latest iteration of that technology is Aluminium Conductor Composite Core or ACCC cable 
using a carbon and glass fiber composite core encased in aluminium. The composite core provides superior strength and the lighter weight of the carbon fiber allows for about 30% more conductive aluminium to be added. That not only provides much more capacity, up to twice as much in fact, along the same cable run, but it also lowers the electrical resistance, reducing the dreaded line losses and making the cable much more efficient. These modern cables can operate at higher temperatures with much less sag, as this chart shows. The red line at the bottom represents the old ACSR wires, and the blue line right at the top represents the modern ACCC technology. You can see that after about 100 degrees Celsius, ACSR and all the other older versions start to droop quite alarmingly, reaching more than 70 inches or about 1.8 meters at the higher end of the temperature scale. So it's pretty clear from this that ACCC wires are an ideal candidate for reconductoring projects. The benefits don't stop there though. Reconductoring existing supply routes costs about half as much as a full upgrade rebuild. It's also a much faster process too because it quite neatly circumnavigates one of the most time consuming aspects of any energy infrastructure project, which is the permitting process. Because reconductoring comes under the category of maintenance and not new build, there's no requirement to get new permits for the work. That means what can potentially be a decade long process can be reduced to just 18 months to two years. That's a big win for grid operators. This recent study from the folks at Berkeley Lab found that there were no fewer than 10,000 supply projects waiting for grid connection permissions at the end of 2022, 95% of which were from zero carbon sources. That's enough to double the capacity of the United States electricity grid if they could just get themselves connected. So the ability to restring existing networks in the meantime, while we're waiting for new projects to cut through the red tape, will be a crucial part of the race towards decarbonisation of energy. Reconductoring brings several other upstream benefits too. According to the numbers presented during the CTC webinar, reduced line losses and improved efficiency achieved by the reconductoring that CTC has already installed in over 1,100 projects in more than 65 countries around the world are now saving more than 10 million megawatt hours of energy every year, enough to run almost a million US homes or charge nearly 2.5 million electric cars. They're also saving about 100 billion gallons of water used at thermal power plants because those power plants now produce much less of the pointless energy that used to just get lost along the journey to the customer's property. And perhaps most important of all, those efficient new wires are reducing CO2 emissions by more than 4 million metric tons every year. That's like taking nearly a million internal combustion engine cars off the road. And as a final bonus, Taking steel out of the wires and replacing it with carbon fiber composites helps to reduce a phenomenon known as cyclic load fatigue, and it massively reduces corrosion, especially in agricultural and coastal areas. In simple terms, that means the wires last much longer in operation, which is another thumbs up for Jeremy and Colin in the finance department. Reconductoring can't solve all the infrastructure challenges involved in the green energy transition, of course, New capacity will still need to be built out as the prodigious consumption requirements of a globally expanding population exceed even the remarkable efficiency improvements we've talked about today. And as utility grids include an ever increasing amount of renewables like wind and solar onto their systems, a lot of that generation will be located in areas that are not conveniently close to the towns and cities that will house more than 70% of the human population by 2050. America is actually quite a good example. These two maps from the US National Renewable Energy Laboratory, or NREL, show where the wind blows the most and the sun shines the strongest across the country. And this third map shows where the most densely populated areas are. Not a great match, is it? Similar logistical issues exist in many countries around the world. Here in the UK, for example, we have vast offshore wind farms around our coastlines. Over in Germany, the majority of wind is generated in the north, but mostly needed in the south. And of course, the logistics get even more difficult in regions like Africa, Asia and Australia, where transmission distances can be enormous. The advent of these new super materials will not only make those new supply lines much more efficient, but if countries can effectively double the capacity of existing networks at a fraction of the cost and in a quarter of the time it takes to complete new build projects, then it provides an extremely important buffer zone 
while nations sort out the bureaucratic complexities of their existing regulatory systems, and it may just make the difference between hitting our net zero targets and missing them. If you've worked with this technology yourself, or if you've just got news and views on electrical grid systems or the energy transition more generally, then why not jump down to the comment section below and leave your thoughts there, and I'll be interested to see what you think. That's it for this week though. Before I go, just a very quick note to let you know that I'll be hosting discussion panels on each of the three days of the upcoming Everything Electric Live event in London this Easter, organized by our friends over at the Fully Charged channel. And when I'm not on stage, I'll be mooching about having a look at the astonishing array of exhibitors and new vehicles that you can only get to see at the world's number one home energy and electric vehicle show. If you fancy coming along to say hello, then you can get 20% off your tickets using the discount code on the screen, exclusively for viewers of the Just Have A Think channel. Follow the link on screen or in the description section below. See you there. A massive thank you to our Patreon supporters, without whom this channel quite simply would not exist. And an extra special thank you to the folks whose names are scrolling up the screen beside me here, all of whom celebrate an anniversary of Patreon support in March. If you fancy getting exclusive early access to all my videos and having your say on the direction of the channel's content, then why not jump over to patreon.com forward slash just have a think to find out how you can get involved. And if you don't want to miss out on notifications of new videos each week, then make sure you click on that subscribe button. It doesn't cost a penny to do that, and it's just a simple click away down there somewhere or on that icon there. As always, thanks very much for watching. Have a great week, and remember to just have a think. See you next week.